Hello, I'm Dr. Anil Gudi, consultant in reproductive medicine, surgery and assisted conception at the Homet University Hospital, London. Let us talk about a slightly more basic topic today. It's about HCG, human chorionic gonadotrophin. What is HCG? Now, we know that in nature, LH surge is needed and is essential for a final triggering of ovulation. But there's a problem when we use it for our medical treatments. There is inconsistency of LH surge and hence HCG has been uniformly adopted as an ov for ovulation induction. Now HCG works if pre-ovulatory follicles are present and that is very important. And what does it do? As soon as you give HCG, it causes granulosa cell luteinization. There's a switch that occurs from estradiols and thesis to progesterone synthesis, which is very important when we start looking at over-responders. There is resumption of meiosis and probably an error rate can start occurring, and oocyte maturation. The reason is, you remember, aneuploides are meiotic in origin, mosaics are mitotic in origin. Subsequent follicular rupture would occur between 36 hours and 40 hours after trigger. It's not fixed to 36 hours. The most important thing is that this would only occur if the follicles are of appropriate size. Granulosa and theca cell receptivity is adequate, which again depends on LH receptor status. And that's the reason why you need the follicles to have reached to 17, 18, 19 or 20 millimeter before you start triggering them. Now, for many years, HCG has been used as a surrogate for LH. They're both quite similar. They're both glycoproteins. They have identical alpha subunits and are high cysteine levels. And they have the same natural function. They induce luteinization. And that's their main function and support the luteal cells. Let's look at something very interesting, which has a significant impact on how we use these drugs. When you compare the pharm pharmacokinetics, there is a metabolic clearance rate that is a rapid disappearance period, but LH has a very short period of five to nine hours. A slower clearance rate is for HCG between one to 1.3 days. That's a huge difference. If you look at the initial half-life and half the life of the drug is gone, for HCG it's 5.5 to 1.3 hours. LH is 0.8 hours. So if you see, there is a significant difference between HCG and LH in the initial half-life and the terminal half-life also. And what it is telling us is that HCG remains in the system much longer. If you have a look at the chart, you see a drastic variation between HCG, which is urinary, HCG, which is recombinant, and HCG, which is oh, an LH, which comes from a period free. I'll say something very, very interesting. A lot, many believe that the HCG given does not make the pituitary release LH. It's wrong. In fact, it does not stop a spontaneous LH surge. So you may give it CG and 12 hours later, you may still have a spontaneous LH surge, which is unrelated to the HCG. And that's something very important to realize is that without knowing whether there's spontaneous LH surge, that HCG injection to a large extent doesn't induce ovulation. Second, as soon as you give HCG, luteinization starts and progesterone levels rise immediately. So again, if you're going to do a progesterone level a day after HCG or a day of ovum pickup, it's going to be high and it's quite, it doesn't tell you the, the right things that you need to know. Next, we come to the consequences of HCG. HCG has a sustained leukotrophic effect. So what it does is it gives you multiple corpus luteum. This in turn gives rise to high E2 levels and high progesterone levels. Another factor, which again is responsible for ovarian hyperstimulation. Let's see the difference between LH and 
NHCG. LH is a trigger, increases FSH and LH, both required for the final maturation. HCG only does one thing, it does not increase FSH. High E2 and progesterone levels may be responsible for implantation failure. Also, HCG acts on smaller follicles and can cause delayed ovulation and then thus it prolongs ovarian hyperstimulation and also can cause multiple pregnancies. The other question we get asked is, what dose of HCG to give? Again, in an IVF cycle. The trial was done from by 2000, 5000 and 10,000. And there's no difference in number of oocytes retrieved from 5000 and 10,000, while there was a significant number of oocytes, lower oocytes, when you give 2000 of HCG. We know that recombinant HCG of 2,250 microgram, that's Ovitral, is as effective as urinary HCG of 5,000 HCG. There's also some evidence that if you gave two Ovitrals or recombinant HCG, you may get more oocytes, but there's a three times higher risk of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. When you compare both, it seems that recombinant HCG has less local reaction than urinary HCG. That isn't brief about HCG. Again, remember its role is huge in luteal phase support in nature. The corpus luteum survives and prolongs its life only because of HCG. And that is something which you have to remember. Do we give HCG for recurrent miscarriages? Do we give HCG for improving pregnancy rates outside an analog cycle, I don't think there is any evidence about it. But as we move further into looking at analog triggers, the amount of analog triggers, looking at whether the analog triggers have worked and all that turns out to be a far more fascinating subject. But it's important to know that HCG on its own does have very important effects. Again, if you like this page, you know, please share it. Once again, I request you to spread it across your medical trainees or postgraduate trainees so that that interest is created in reproductive medicine, that people realize that uh, like this fascinating other branches of medicine, this too is a very fascinating branch. Thank you. Lastly, if you are doing assisted conception, please read David Gardner's book. The fifth edition has come up on clinical perspectives. And I think it's one of the best books to read. Thank you.